Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, very warm welcome to um, Transparency International. Um, I'm very glad we have this event today, which marks uh, the launch of the latest report um, on climate finance, but also a 10 year uh, anniversary of, of TI contributing to this uh, important topic of climate governance and, and good governance when it comes to, to climate and, and the transition. Um, I'm Brice and I'm heading uh, TI's work on climate and environmental issues. Um, and I'm delighted to, to moderate this workshop um, with our great speakers that you can see on screen. So today um, we will talk about what corruption can do when it comes to affecting climate change. And unfortunately, the effects can be catastrophic. It is undoubtedly a key driver of climate change and at the same time, an important reason why the fight against climate change is failing. TI defines corruption as the abuse of untrusted power for private gain. So this is quite a large um, definition. And climate or green corruption occurs at different levels, from ground corruption to influencing laws or policies affecting the environment, to bribery, to attempt to bypass environmental safeguards, and when it comes to environmental protection programs, uh, corruption put at risk with millions being embezzled by a few corrupt individuals uh, or ill-managed. But there are also very good initiatives, uh, including from the multilateral funds we've been assessing and working with in the past months and years. When it comes to climate finance, there should simply be no chance for corruption to interfere. So it is key to not re repeat previous mistakes, but share lessons learned, key opportunities for improvements, and seeing how we can work together so that each one of us individually and collectively can play their roles uh, in fighting that corruption. I would like to briefly introduce uh, great speakers today. Uh, we'll hear from them. And then, as I said, uh, keep some time, hopefully, for, for an interesting Q&A. Uh, we will hear first um, from a keynote from Dia Zakir Khan from Bangladesh, representing academia and, and research to set the scene. Then we will hear uh, a presentation by Michael Nest, um, an independent consultant and corruption expert who is the main author of the report to highlight the key learnings and recommendations from the report. And after that presentation, we will have responses and additional point of view from representatives of uh, different sectors, so to speak. So first, uh, a recipient country, Diane Black Lane from the Ministry of Antigua and Barbuda, then from the Green Climate Fund, uh, Ibrahim Pam, uh, who, from the GCF Integrity Unit. Um, after that, from civil society, uh, Sano Akteru Zaman, uh, who is the chair of uh, the GEF CSO network. Um, and uh, finally, from a donor country, Dr. Uzula Fuentes, who would filter from the F Federal Foreign Office of Germany. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Zakir Khan. Uh, Zakir Khan is working as executive director as, uh, at Change Initiative, a new knowledge-based think tank on environment, climate and natural resource conservation. He's involved in the field of climate finance governance for more than a decade, and now supporting UNDP on climate adaptation finance and GCF readiness for Lebanon government. Earlier, he contributed to GIZ as technical expert and provided support to establish an international climate finance cell within the Ministry of Finance in Bangladesh. Before that, he was a TI colleague working to research the effects of corruption uh, and that corruption has on the fight uh, against the climate crisis. Zakia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Brice. Uh, I'm glad that uh, after a long time I have been able to just speak on behalf of the Transparency International Secretariat. And uh, let me begin by expressing the great pleasure uh, I have to be able to share the airwaves with committee and bright fellow colleagues from uh, different uh, organizations and participants today. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm eager to open our discussion on a topic that uh, would be in front and center in solving the current crisis that the world faces, especially the climate crisis. It is also a topic that is particularly 
pressing for me personally, as it will also decide the fate of the beautiful ecosystems, natures, and the, especially the victim uh, population of the LDCs, uh, particularly in my native Bangladesh. I'm talking about the governance of climate finance and how anti-corruption maximizes the impacts of climate initiatives. Yes, indeed, uh, this is uh, definitely the crisis period. As the IPCC reports recently, the, the last report has properly revealed that what's really going on. The emergence is not only emergence, but also it is a matter of whether we will survive or not. And no doubt is that, that we are not doing enough to avoid that worst case scenario. I'm proud to be part of this conversation around the launch of this vital report. As, research, as the researchers estimate that climate investment must increase at least six folds just to have a uh, to chance to reach the climate targets. If I can have some, uh, if I can just uh, see what is the real climate finance demand supply gaps, then what is going on in the in terms of that? The next slide, please. Diana. So if we see uh, the in terms of the Copenhagen Accord, what was promised that $100 billion as a new and additional to be the ODA could be delivered uh, per year mm -hmm. from 2020, the one was up until 2025. But in reality, the last figure what we are seeing here, we have seen here is not really very much impressive. So in, in the 20 up to 2020, it is rather below $1 trillion in terms of the overall climate specific funds, but in terms of the $100 billion, it is less than $100 billion still. We don't uh, have able to reach the situation. If we would like to reach the Paris targets, if you see the, the this is the curve we have to reach by that time. But unfortunately, we don't know actually what is happening. On the other hand, the global scenario, the global, I mean the disaster related loss, the recent report has been rebuild that the almost it is low income countries the most vulnerable and they are the most more victims rather than compared to the high income countries in terms of both uh, uh, percentile of gdp as well as value of the bill yeah, and it, it has been rightly pointed out that almost six times we have to reach uh, a six times uh, the uh, i mean uh, increase of the current delivery from the developed countries next slide please um, so the, the, this is the very, very much impressive and uh, rightly IPCC, the last report has properly uh, uh, mentioned that corruption and abuse and new influence is obstacle to the reaching the goal actually. And this is not actually the uh, science or social science issue rather than it is the reality because we are putting money uh, in the same institution which are predominantly weak in terms of the governance and anti-corruption measures, especially in the LDC in other countries. So, and also uh, the, but unfortunately that has not been finally added in the summary document of the, uh, uh, which is really was used, uh, supposed to be added, but unfortunately that does not happen, but that is really useful, uh, required to just mention. And I believe that IPCC would take care of that. And also uh, what I told in between 2019 and 2020, it, it is almost more than $600 billion has been uh, invested as a climate investment. And it has been continuing to reach uh, increase in, the, in terms of the number. But, and that is also important to see that the last report on the transparency index, the uh, most of the both uh, climate funds provider as well as the climate recipient countries are also in the bottom quantile of the corruption perception index, which is really unfortunate because this is the vulnerability, is a climate vulnerability. We are facing the COVID-19 vulnerability. Another vulnerability is a climate uh, corruption vulnerability, which has been jeopardized the whole uh, intensity of the vulnerability. So that is really important to see because the, one of the study, has, several study have revealed that from as little 1.4 to uh, as much as 35 percent of the climate fund has been used, misused, and not properly been invested. So that's why it is really important to uh, whether will the climate vulnerable population will be jeopardized or not. That is depend on the quality of the financing or the investment in the in the in the ground. And because the 
current any depletion of the uh, uh, of the climate finance regime it has been direct adverse and disproportionate impacts of the already vulnerable the people of the country and the and then ldc's next slide please so um, so so uh, this uh, so uh, the the issue is that we are here actually whatever the multilateral funding or whatever the national funding doesn't matter it when it comes to the climate related funding or climate relevant funding it is really important to protect uh, the funds with the proper safeguards and transparency international has long recognized that the climate change as, as the most pressing uh, challenge of 21st century tried to highlight the interlinkages between the risk of climate and corruption so our uh, perspective is this year is the, actually the pressing year for the transparency international especially at all the progress have to be created if we don't have a proper actions next slide please so uh, this is the actually figure uh, uh, from the multilateral development banks if i see the the in terms of the adaptation and mitigation adapt the climate vulnerable countries need the more funding for the adaptation but unfortunately in terms of the world bank group uh, finds and other uh, multilateral implementing entity the uh, the poor, uh, that, uh, that was the agreement in the under the paris agreement at least 50-50 that has not been ensured and what is really important to know that because the share of the global south government resources derived to foreign debt repayment has been triple from 2011 to 2020 and again the another uh, debt burden is going up actually due to the climate uh, is the covid-19 recovery funding so that has to be taken care of because when it comes to the climate finance it should be public and grant money but unfortunately that is not happening in town let's let this so uh, i i will not go detail on the gcf part on the special in the governance part is because that was the key uh, i mean unf triple c process Uh, that has been ensured that GCF or the Green Climate Fund. Whether we have to think whether is, it is actually in terms of the paradigm shift, you know, how far that has been contributing. I believe the in, independent integrity unit uh, Ibrahim is there he, he more shade on that. But is uh, what is really important from the governance point of view that GCF. Um, uh, it is the recent uh, synthesis report of the I, I integrity and uh, evaluation unit. they have been identified there are lots of uh, um, governance challenges right now still we it's important and uh, in terms of the environmental social safeguard policy uh, gcf policy remain as unresolved and also uh, the concept of paradigm shift remains ill understood among the stakeholders of the gcf and secondly reporting of the progress toward paradigm shifting path has been vague it is it is not my uh, uh, um, uh, uh, observation rather than say Uh, independent evaluation and gcf has not yet developed any effective standards for the country's uh, ownership and other thing and gcf structure as a not adequately leverages the concept capacity of the cso and private sector especially when it comes to the country level investment next slide please so uh, this report uh, uh, basically uh, uh, so i i i will just close by uh, next one or uh, maximum two minutes so the huge financial flow of the climate finance of partel and ground for the corruption this is and the very recently uh, one of the study uh, we, uh, we did actually and that uh, tai bangladesh was uh, uh, the part of the study with the swas and it we have found that some cases the project 35% of the project fund was misused and and that's why we have to prop up the innovation on climate finance governance globally and next slide please so this is the report i have just uh, shared on some of our overall uh, the the major findings of the reports still the important is that why that the multilateral uh, financial implement uh, institution why that actually the paradigm shift from the development the sustainable development why that they have internalized the whole uh, mechanism of the philosophy as well as the institutions with respect to the sustainable development perspective or not that is really important because uh, the 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 my philosophy is really important uh, and in terms of because the proactive disclosure of the beneficiary in some cases we have found the liver, uh, limited oversight in the ground and when it comes to flow from the uh, global funding to the uh, national level funding we have find the meaningful citizens friendly governance redress mechanisms or independent oversight is are truly absent so we have to focus on that and finally uh, next slide please 
So we have to focus on whenever it comes to the climate finance, we should not only focus on the standalone, rather the integrated finance for climate specific actions, as well as post COVID-19 green recovery funding and development finance, and finally philanthropic innovation finance. So we have come to the pull together all the finance. And finally, I, I would say that last slide, um, uh, Diana. So dwell, uh, dwell uh, I mean, the, the, just before the slide. So dwell, we use the approach of the uh, methods, what we have studied that uh, during the process of the climate finance, rather than we have to more focus on the, how can we just uh, design the project such a way that the horizontal check or the stakeholders could be ensured that with a proper incentive base, the whole climate uh, project design would be in such a way that the community would be proactively engaged in the monetary and the project design would more focus on not only particularly on the anti-corruption measure, but also for project design to finally implementation. An oversight mechanism should be community and CSO. -led. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking one more or two more minutes. Thank you very much for giving allow me to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Takia. And there is a lot to, to say indeed. Um, so let's uh, let's go to to Michael Nest. Uh, Dr. Michael Nest has worked on governance, accountability, and transparency issues uh, for 20 years, including as a researcher and as a practitioner uh, and anti-corruption agencies in the private sector and for civil society organizations. So much of his work has focused on the exploitation of natural resources. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. I think we already had a glimpse in the report, but uh, you will talk a bit more about that. Yes, uh, thank you, Bryce. And just to confirm, you can hear me OK? OK. Yes, very good. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you very much for participating today. So the main reason we wanted to do this review was really due to the proliferation of climate funds and an awareness that corruption has diverted funds from climate action. Um, more and more funding is going to climate action. As uh, Sakir just pointed out, it was around 600, million, 600 billion um, euro in uh, uh, 2019, 2020. The five funds we reviewed together have pledge commitments of 38 billion. There are very apparent governance risks. There are a growing number of cases of fraud and corruption and other wrongdoing. And there are also evolving expectations of governance from both uh, donors and also from civil society. So Transparency International had done numerous reviews from 2014 um, uh, and then another round of reviews around 2017. And these seem to have made a difference, although it is hard to directly connect um, that kind of review with improvements um, uh, around climate fund governance. However, reviews do seem to be an effective tool for bringing attention to how climate funds and funding can be improved. So in terms of methods, our basic procedure was to verify that a policy or other written guidance document was in place to um, uh, address four key issues, integrity, accountability, transparency, and then the effectiveness of policy review mechanisms. We did not look in detail at each policy because this would have effectively been a detailed policy review rather than a review of the governance framework, which was the intention. And it was a comparative review. So we looked at five um, uh, different funds. For those who are, are not um, uh, aware, these were the Adaptation Fund, the Central African Forest Initiative, the Climate Investment Fund, the Green Climate Fund, and the Global Environment Facility. Um, we also we did not look at policy implementation, which would normally be a part of a full evaluation of governance because that was beyond the scope of the exercise. However, we did fight, try to find cases of alleged breaches of governance, and some of these are documented in the report. Such cases can reveal whether governance frameworks are adequate because cases of wrongdoing and the response show if organizations have in place policies and procedures to guide their response to the alleged wrongdoing that occurred. Uh, organizations never like this kind of exposure uh, and it can be difficult to get all of the facts uh, clearly and correctly if they're not in the public domain and often what is in the public domain isn't always clear. Uh, but nevertheless, these kind of cases are invaluable in demonstrating adequate governance. 
For this report, compared to a previous report in 2017, where we focused on only four funds, so the Central African Forest Initiative was not included in the 2017 report. For this report, we changed the goalposts. And by that, I mean that we assess the five funds against some new criteria not previously used in earlier governance reviews. So the funds don't like this because they feel like whenever they improve something, the bar is raised again. And, that, and this is true. But governance and expectations around it do and have evolved, and it is essential that standards remain high. And that is why we add new, added new criteria. So themes that were added to this report or given more emphasis compared to previous reviews were gender, lobbying, inclusivity, online accessibility, and language. And I'll just very briefly summarize these. So lobbying around climate action has an increased profile due to lobbying in particular around the COP meetings, most recently in Glasgow, but also at the national level. And there's been quite a lot of research on lobbying and climate action. Previous reviews had little emphasis on gender. So in this report, we gave it more emphasis. We looked for proactive inclusivity in the form of policies that promote fairness and greater participation, especially by indigenous people. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, it became clear that online accessibility was ever more important and it also uh, have able to reach the obtain information about governance um, in the funds through websites. So we emphasized online accessibility. And then finally, uh, language was important because it broadens transparency and accountability when documents are available or complaints can be made in languages other than English. So I'll briefly summarize both findings and recommendations, uh, and I'll bundle these together thematically rather than go through them in detail. So in terms of findings and the four key areas, overall, the policy frameworks around integrity were strongest and found to be uh, fairly comprehensive across all five funds, especially around codes of conduct and financial management. For accountability, there are some highs and some lows. Complaints handling mechanisms, anti-corruption hotlines, and staker engagement policies are generally well covered by all funds. However, we thought that there could be clear information on sanctions, including whose responsibility it is to apply sanctions and what those sanctions are specifically. We found inconsistency around transparency. We had some difficulties finding important documents on websites. Uh, there, is uneven, there are uneven requirements across funds about what information needs to be disclosed by the funds and also by their implementing partners. But the biggest weakness, again, was about access to policies in languages other than English. In terms of reviewing policy effectiveness, the four largest funds have sophisticated evaluation mechanisms, including inde independent evaluation units, and they publish many reviews and evaluations online. So this was pleasing. The Central African Forest Initiative also reviews its implementing partners and its programs, but less information was available to us about its approach to monitoring and evaluation, so its methods, um, although final uh, reports are actually online. So then for recommendations, and again, I won't read all of these, but I'm just gonna summarize them thematically. There were 24 recommendations in total and almost half focused on broadening accountability. For integrity, Although we found that board members and secretariat staff are usually covered and well covered by ethics and code of um, conduct policies, we recommended that these kind of policies and codes be extended to observers, advisors, external technical consultants, and anybody else who might be involved in um, a, a climate funded uh, action. For accountability, our key recommendations focused on four areas. We thought that there, we recommended that there should be more comprehensive policies around sanctions if wrongdoing is found, including funds expectations of their implement, implementing partners' responsibilities for applying sanctions, and that sanctions should be easily accessible on funds' website in terms of what is available, but also what is applied. We also recommend Please. that funds governing bodies be more accountable in terms of stakeholders being able to demand explana explanations of decisions and that this should be the policy. So there should be a, a, a broader and a deeper policy of permitting uh, stakeholders to query why a decision was made. On the issue of gender, we recommended policies that better connect investments in climate action to specific outcomes for women, for example, improve livelihoods. So it's not enough to have a gender policy that just says that women will be involved in decision-making, but really that kind of, that policy should clearly connect 
what the um, purpose of uh, uh, climate investment that specifically includes women should actually achieve for those women. And then finally, we recommended that community stakeholders should be given more influence in selecting projects and selecting implementing partners. For transparency, our recommendations uh, emphasize improving better risk management around lobbying in particular, so lobbying to shape climate investments, as well as better access to policies in languages other than English. So the obvious policy, the obvious languages to choose are the UN languages, the six, um, but certainly in countries where there are very large investments such as Indonesia, Bangladesh, um, also Brazil, uh, we think there is a very good case for languages being available in Portuguese, Indonesian or Bengali. Uh, and then finally, for policy effectiveness, we recommend that funds publish their evaluation criteria for policy reviews, either by themselves or what they require their implementation, their implementing partners to do, and that they post all of their reviews online as soon as practical. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Bryce, but happy to answer any questions later. Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, dive in and, uh, and for being as um quick as possible. <laughs> um, we will now turn uh, to uh, Diane Black Lane. Um, so Diane is Chief Environmental Officer and Ambassador for Climate Change in the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands, Housing and the Environment of Antigua and Barbuda, who will be hosting the next uh, Green Climate Fund uh, board meeting, by the way. She has been in the field of environment management for over 20 years and has worked in all areas of the field, such as protected areas, development of legislation and policy, preparing project documents and seeking international funding as well as designing national financial mechanisms for environmental management in seeds. Diane, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, sorry, I'm home with my kid, so just in case, just be prepared for kid one and behind me. Um, okay, so thank you so much for this opportunity to participate in this project. Um, as you see, I've been working in this area for a really long time. My home, Antigua and Barbuda, is pretty much smack dab in Hurricane Alley. Uh, we are right now in the middle of a drought. And so um, we always say within the climate space that many countries have climate finance ambition, <laughs> but not climate ambition. So Antigua and Barbuda is one of those small countries, very small population, and highly motivated for accessing climate finance because of we actually get affected. So, um, uh, so the international, uh, when I came on the scene and I, I start to apply for funding, so we are a recipient country. We are, my organization have over the years applied with a focal point for the Jeff for the Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund. We have access funding from all three entities. And um, it was really interesting when I started first, um, a lot of the, it was really difficult to get access to funding. And um, for a small country like mine, um, all of these procedures that have been put in place to prevent corruption and to improve project quality and so on. Actually, with the death, the project resulted in a project timeline of about six years. Same with the World Bank and others, six years. <laughs> so if you're trying to solve a, so if you wanted $100 million to cut down the whole forest and create jobs, you can get that in six months. If you want $100 million to protect the forest, you <laughs> years will pass. So. One of the things that I was interested in is like, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a marine biologist, um, and I always think that there's a way to be open, be transparent, address the issue of fraud, uh, party quality, um, policy quality, you know, much faster. And I think we push that, uh, and then we see that independent evaluation unit of the Jeff, for example, came out with a report, which highlighted a lot of these things, that there's a better way to do this. And that changed everything. And now I think the Jeff project cycle is down to 22 to 24 months, but it's still longer. So climate finance is competing with finance from the fossil fuel industry and so on. And they can, you can get money much quicker from the fossil fuel industry. They have no problems with bribing. They have no problems. They have their lobbying. All of the issues that you see here outlined in this report, they do it all the time. That is legal, that is allowed. And then we have the climate finance that has to be squeaky clean. If one dollar is missing, the project is shut down. So that is the balance. That is the this landscape that we are working in. And a cut in between that now is all of the recipient countries 
who are really need these fund this funds and no other way of accessing those funds and how do we get access to those funds without shutting it down because of fraud so i've been working at this now for 20 years and tegan Babila, we have the commonwealth manage, uh, commonwealth system just like bangladesh and other countries the uk we have a really strong governance system that is in place um yes everything once you're dealing with human beings everything can be corrupted um, some people are very good at doing corrupt practices more than others, just like any other field. And we have experienced all of, I've experienced in my, in my implementation of all of that. So um, in my country too, there's strong Christian belief and the integrity of an individual in my country is, is, is shaped by that. Um, that is a strength in terms of our success so far in minimizing fraud. Of, but of course, in the areas where we actually occurred for it, it was also the weakness that we had. Um, so, so in general, um, we have seen um, our ability. So based on the report that I've read and I, I've seen it, I think some parts of the report I fully agree with and some parts of the report that gives me chills. Report gave me chills because I can see us. We have to be extremely careful the way that it is implemented so that we don't go back to a four year project cycle. I think it must be very clear that we can do these things without having an inefficient project cycle. And that is one of the biggest fears that I have um, because I keep telling my team here, uh, all we do is paperwork. I'm a marine biologist. I haven't seen a live fish swimming at a beach for a long time. I've gone scuba diving in a while because we're just so busy just doing paperwork. And um, every time there's a new standard, we see um, a new report, a new way of reporting come out. So right now at the department, we have 19 projects and just the compliance report is 1,022 compliance report. Now, I want to say something about that. If we want to be open and transparent, no, not even transparent international is going to read my 1,022 report. So basically, if you want to hide something, all you do is just flood the world with more reports. So um, that is, so we've seen all of these reports coming out, all of this information coming out and everybody is even those who have to provide oversight to us is just swamped secondly most of the one of the biggest problems that i see with the international funds is that a project document is written in a way that is in language not not in english language um it's not a it's not an issue in addition to being spanish and all of those other languages but in the english language maybe about five percent of the people speak that way so I will challenge any of you to go and read one of those project documents and actually understand what the project is intended to do, except for some straightforward one like uh, renewable energy and so on. So, you know, and then um, um, press the percentage correct. When it comes to the issue of gender, um, there are many sides to it that we have experienced here. And uh, there are two issues that I wanted to pick up there with consequences. What happened when you do find fraud, when you do find corruption, how do you implement consequences? And um, gender is a big issue with that. And it's for the different reason that you're not <laughs> understanding. One, yes, when we design a project with gender, literally, we just tick a box. Yes, we had a workshop. Yes, we drag women out of their house in the afternoon to come to a workshop. We signal, yes, we're happy they actually attended and they made to participate. No, there actually have to be a budget line for them to implement activities, benefit from activities, get impact on their life. That is not strong in um, many of the funds with the exception, I would say, of the adaptation fund. Now let's talk about fraud and corruption and our experience with it. Um, in the past 10 years, if we have lost about only around 10,000 US in fraud. And um, when it comes to um, corruption, both of the thing, things that are corrupted here, especially with climate finance, is not what you think. It's not uh, the loss in cash. It's the loss in opportunity. Um, so we have slowed down our work here, and so the, our utility company says, oh, well, we need an engine. So now they sign another 20-year. Um, uh, we're taking so long to get the, the funds, they, they sign another 20-year contract for new engines. And as soon as that was done, funds started to flow again. So what are we going to do with this money for renewable energy? You know, as it, that's an example. We lost in time because we spend, we lock in all of these uh, intelligent people on this call and so on, so busy just doing paperwork that drags out. Um, we have lost the confidence of our people. 
On the issue of fraud, there's one agenda, an interesting agenda tidbit, so, and I'll close with that, is that most of the fraud that we've had committed in Antigua and Barbuda, and I'll go back to our, our religious beliefs in this country, were committed by women. And in most of the times, it was involved the accountant in our, in our organization, and in two cases, the accountant is wives of pastors of major churches in, in the country. So um, they are held, so people in great position of trust um, sometimes is the area that we are most vulnerable. Like I said before, it's a strength, but it's a vulnerability. When it comes to politicians, which everybody talk, um, talk about, that's really difficult to talk about. And we all know this. I work with the government. I cannot say anything negative about my minister. So whether I say something positive uh, or not, nobody can tell whether it's the truth because that is my job to do. However, the mechanism to provide, um, to prevent ministers and, to pre and the consequences for ministers is clearly laid out. We understand what those are. And it's the only sector of people that we work with that that is clear. When it comes to technicians within the government entity, especially when, or when it comes to the private sector, in terms of when you identified fraud, that is not clear. Mm. Um, the consequences for that is not very clear. We're still working on that. So we have a long way to go to ensure that we can continue to um, prevent fraud, which we have done. We have spent millions of dollars every year. The incidence of fraud is low, but the time that it's taken to do this, and especially for a developing country that is a black country where it, it's given that black people are co-ops, and especially if, unfortunately, for African black people, if we speak like um, Ibrahim, for example, you are definitely corrupt. So we're dealing with, we're fighting against perception, um, a, a direct access entity like mine. We're fighting against perception. We're fighting against um, many other perceptions um, that is not necessarily true. And and the, the losses where we are, I'm on this call today because I want to say we are desperate in Antigua and Barbuda to make sure that we are delivering money to the beneficiaries and losing as little as possible. We will lose some. That's mm -hmm. another thing. The funds say that they are high risk and they will lose money. But even if they lose one dollar, it's in the New York Times. So we mm -hmm. have to give a latitude to say, what can you lose without locking down everything? So um, this is why I'm here to hear, get a feedback to see how we can have that clear balance is not the word. We can absolutely stop fraud without having to introduce um, difficulty for access from beneficiary. Thanks. Thank you very much, Diane. And yeah, thank you for, for all the important points you raised. Um, you have also a lot uh, <laughs> to, to bring to that conversation. And, uh, and you already kind of gave the floor to, to Ibrahim in a way. So uh, Ibrahim Pam is the, the head of the GCF Independent Integrity Unit for almost six years now. So also a lot to share. And unfortunately, we don't have too much time today, but we should maybe organize a follow-up uh, conversation to today so that we can have uh, other uh, debates. Um, he previously worked as an analyst and investigator in the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, and then as Chief Investigator in the Integrity and Anti-Corruption Department of the African Development Bank. So, Ibrahim, the floor is yours, and hopefully you can also uh, touch upon some of the points that Diane uh, brought forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruce. Um, and it would take far more than five minutes to respond to Diane's very interesting comments. Um, and thank you, Diane. I think we just to set the context, the way that we uh, approach our work is captured in the way that the IPCC, the latest IPCC report describes, describes the dire situation that we're in. Um, it's been described as the bleakest report ever. Um, the, the UN Secretary General describes it as an atlas of human suffering. Um, the, the effects on small island states like Antigua and Barbuda are said to be cataclysmic. Um, so we keep this in mind as we work uh, because it's very important then to locate what we're doing. Um, we very much welcome the, the report by Transparency International, um, the, the first report in 2017 and this report because then civil society performs a really important function as a guardian of accountability um, and, and the oversight and the scrutiny that you provide helps us to further shape and refine our processes. Um, just to say that um, uh, for stronger governance, 
um, a climate finance institution must address three main integrity issues from our point of view. Uh, one is to create prevention safeguards. Um, I, I think you're all aware of the saying that an ounce of prevention is worth more than a, a kilo of, of cure. And then we create an integrity and fiduciary framework, which then addresses the risks that we find in, in, in climate financing. But also we, we come at this with a risk management approach, um, identifying risks, therefore being in a position to be able to address and prevent them. Uh, and, and, you know, within that context, of course, Diane's, um, the work that Diane does would benefit significantly from sort of our risk, uh, risk based approach to dealing with integrity matters. And so at the GCF, in the Independent Integrity Unit, we have taken a very bold, proactive prevention approach. That's the centerpiece of our work over the last six years. We've built out a strong integrity policy framework, a robust policy environment that enables integrity for all stakeholders and in all of our projects. We, we also bank on innovative and intelligent automation tools in identifying and managing integrity risks in the implementation of projects. And I'll just give you an example. What we do is we've developed a tool that is a, uh, a, an automated tool that uses machine learning to identify red flags in projects. Now, it's a, it's a technical tool and it's complex, but what it does essentially is it takes in all the project data and it tells us through an objective means where we're finding red flags. And this enables us to act quickly in order to prevent these red flags from becoming integrity violations. That way we can also strengthen internal control frameworks in our, in our partner entities. And we're doing this um, with, you know, a lot of expectation and ambition. I think ambition is at the heart of the work of the GCF, is at the heart of the work of climate financing. And in order to encourage and to build trust with donor countries and with those who put their money down to ensure that we're able to achieve these objectives, we've got to show that we have the means and the tools by which we can ensure accountability, transparency, and integrity. And that's where the, the oversight of civil society is, is really important. Um, and we, we look to facilitating as well cross-learning and exchanges. It's no good if one entity is doing well. We've all got, this is a network. This is, we're all interdependent uh, and the planet depends on us to work together. So we, we're looking to create these networks of cross-learning and exchanges. And that's something that TI has been doing quite effectively um, in collaboration with GIZ. And the GCF is committed to working closely um, in these areas. We're also looking to create a platform for collaboration with amongst the, the climate funds. We believe it's critical and important to do so. Um, we're looking to, uh, to, before the end of this year, to have an integrity summit where we bring together all of the climate funds uh, and, and uh, agree these common standards and, and processes. Uh, the GCF is the youngest of the climate funds, perhaps with the ex exception of the Central African Forest Initiative. I'm not very sure about that. But what we have done in five or six years is to accelerate the uh, emergence of standards for climate finance integrity. Um, and we're doing this very deliberately, knowing that that's the only way to uh, to enhance uh, uh, financing and to meet and to close that fi financing gap um, that that we talk about. Obviously, five minutes is is a very short time for me to go over everything we're doing. Um, but just to say, you know, the GCF is developing also new methods and processes for gaining greater efficiency. Uh, we've recently launched a digital accreditation platform. Um, we have a, a fast track uh, project uh, um, uh, fund, project approval process. As we go along, we learn. Obviously, five years is a short time in the lifespan of an institution. I understand there's a lot of impatience to get it done. That's the urgency of the mission. But I see that um, the GCF is is really 
reaching for greater ambition and and we're responding to the um to the to the uh the the feedback that we get um on how we can perform better as an institution but thanks very much for this report and we certainly look forward to engaging further on all of the issues thrown up uh, and hopefully brace you'd have another platform where we can speak in detail about the issues that that have come up today thank you Thank you very much, Ibrahim, and thanks for yeah all the the terrific initiatives that you are driving. And sorry, I have to to condense all of you. I feel very bad, and I'm not doing a good job because uh, it's very hard to to cut you um, because it's it's very interesting the different perspectives. And you also uh, made the transition to um, talking about oversight of civil society and and working together. To our next speaker, um, Sano Akteuzaman, who is the chair of the Global uh, Environment Facility CSO Network. Uh, he is also on the JEF um, SGP UNDP Cambodia Steering Committee and is supporting different projects on gender and climate and establishing social accountability and quality management systems. Uh, Sano, I'm sorry, as, as we are approaching uh, already the, the end of the event, I would really ask you to, to keep your intervention as short as possible so that we can also hear from um, from Mozula and then hopefully have a few minutes for uh, for our conversation. The floor is yours, Sano. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Very yeah, well. Good. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Transparency International for organizing this uh, great global event uh, from where all the different level of participants are around. So uh, greetings from JFCSO Network. As the chair of the JFCSO Network, uh, I welcome you and uh, uh, appreciate for your time and efforts for joining this event. So the issue is the uh, corruption-free climate finance and how to strengthen the multilateral funds. So first, I, would, uh, I want to make a uh, recommendation how, how to initiate this process. We, ha we have a lot of uh, uh, techniques and uh, methodology and processes, but uh, still, and the issue of corruption, the issue of mismanagement of the resources are ongoing. And I will share you some examples uh, where I am the I am the witness of this uh, uh, corruption. So so that that can help you. So you can uh, note it and you can use me my uh, message as a reference so that there will be no chance of confusion. So first, what we need to do is. Because when we talk about corruption and mismanagement of the uh, funds, so it is not only at the implementation level, it happens. It happened at the uh, uh, donors level, it happened at the UN level even. So uh, this, uh, to avoid this um, uh, corruption and to reduce this type of corruptions, so we should have twofold fund management systems for all multilateral funds. One fold is the first one is, each multilateral funding agency and the uh, big uh, fund receivers. So example, uh, the fund, um, JEF, Global Environment Facility, they're doing excellent support to, the, um, to um, work on the global uh, uh, climate change issues, uh, environmental issues, uh, but they, this money goes to uh, different agencies and different, um, uh, as for example, uh, JEF have 18 agencies, they're doing good. There are other uh, uh, funding uh, going through other UN agencies. And then um, those money comes to the implementing agencies, CSOs, governments, and then at last they go to the uh, community level. So I'm talking about the middle level of uh, funding agency. I want to share you one example. In Cambodia, we have implemented a project, um, uh, mainstreaming climate resilience in development planning. And there, there is a project that was uh, CIF, Climate Investment Fund through Asian Development Bank and uh, ADBT 8179, Mainstreaming Climate Resilience is Development uh, uh, Planning. So UN Habitat was the lead agency where my agency saved their Cambodia was the um, uh, key management entity uh, for working with the government, working with the communities. And there, UN Habitat, they have not uh, paid the last two big payments. And that is like, as for example, when we implement any project, then uh, they keep uh, certain percentage, like for them, they kept 10% of the money. So when they approved 1.56 uh, 
1.560,500 US dollar approved uh, under 18 installments. That time they kept 10%, that means 156,050 dollar as the money in case be prepared for it. All the project activities are completed. In the same time, there is also another when Asian Development Bank give to UN Habitat, they also keep 5%. They gave the 5% when the project activities was completed. So what happens as the safe debt as the implementing uh, key partner working with the government and community. So UN Habitat did not pay $156,050. That was the money they kept in their hand as the security money. And then the last 5% they received from Asian Development Bank to them, that is the money for the project. And that money has not been paid. So for that, we wrote to the regional office, Fukuoka, Japan. They didn't work. We wrote to the United Nations Cambodia country office, resident coordinator. Her response was very disappointing. And then we, at last we wrote three times to the um, executive director, UN Habitat, Nairobi. And uh, we wrote, and then two times we reminded, they never acknowledged. At last, we had to submit a complaint to OIOS, Office of Internal Oversight. And we are waiting for a result. So why I am sharing, sharing you this information, I can share you the detailed documents to Transparency International for your reference. Why I am sharing? Because we talk about integrity. We talk about transparency. We talk about accountability. When a UN agency is not accountable, is not transparent, is not fulfilling their commitments, written commitments, how a small NGO, how a small implementing entity can fight against them. If today I'm not the chair of the JFCSO network, if I am not engaged widely with all these global events, then maybe the, the world would never know what is happening. So to avoid this type of corruption, I, I use the term corruption for them, to avoid this type of corruption, we have to have this twofold fund management mechanism. When a fund come to this type of agency and come to the implementing agencies, there should have a quantitative, qualitative measures, very strict policy. The donors must double check, triple check whether the money has transferred as per the commitment to the implementing agencies or not. Because when we talk about corruption, always we look at the ground level. And that should not be only they are not they are doing. I'm not telling there is no corruption. Maybe there is some, but mm -hmm. the bigger corruption at the bigger institutions. So we have to make sure the system support to address those issues. The second uh, part of so this. Uh, can, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you can wrap up in, in a few seconds so that we can hear from the last yeah, speaker. I, I, I uh, just two more minutes. So there should have a common and very specific SAM scorecards, country specific, project specific, fund specific, and the uh, common for all. So that it helps to see the uh, progress. About the gender mainstreaming, uh, gender, we need to see a concrete target. After each cycle, what is the ACIP we, we want to do? It is not just telling gender mainstreaming, gender, gender, gender. It does not make any sense to me. We have to see a target. And we have to have the scorecard to measure it. Similarly, a stakeholder in engagement, there should have a concrete mechanism. What we want the stakeholder to engage to do, it is just to see participate in a meeting and go back home, or they need to do something. So we need to see this qualitative and quantitative approach. Similarly, for evaluation criteria, there should have qualitative and quantitative data that can be transferred digitally to see. What is the progress? And that can help the decision makers to understand where we are. Only qualitative measures does not make enough sense to see how effectively it is happening. Thank you very much. And Thank if you, there Sarah. is any question.
Thank you very much, Sano, and um, uh, sorry that we don't have too much time today. And hopefully, I mean, maybe some of you can stay a few more minutes uh, if it's possible for the, if there are a couple of questions already. But let's uh, hear from, last but not least, uh, last speaker, Dr. Ursula fuentes Hutfilter, who is the head of units for financing international climate action and environmental protection uh, in the foreign, Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Uh, prior to this, she was also working as a senior climate policy advisor at Climate Analytics Australia and, and other position focusing on climate policy and energy transformation strategies. Uh, Ursula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, and it's been really uh, great listening um, to this, uh, to all these contributions, um, and um, and 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 also thank you very much uh, um, and congratulations to to uh, to this important uh, report on an important uh, topic. Um, I'll be brief, um, given uh, time, and and others have really highlighted uh, this urgency uh, of addressing. Um, uh, uh, um, the needs uh, to, to close all the gaps uh, that the IPCC report, report has highlighted and, and implementing, of course, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement and, and the importance of, of climate finance um, in this uh, in this space um, is clear. And because of this urgency uh, and because time is running out, it's so important to, to get uh, things uh, right, uh, really, in terms of this transformation that is needed, both uh, to address needs on adaptation and, and mitigation. Um, and um, clearly, I mean, um, um, it would be great to continue uh, uh, the debate. Um, and and uh, uh, Diane has highlighted some some of the issues in terms of looking into a more uh, bigger picture and and uh, 360 degrees. Um, but also the the really the importance of um, learning from uh, um, uh, those uh, with the experience on the ground uh, in terms of this urgency. And um, given well, I'm also a member of the GCF uh, uh, board, uh, and we're meeting uh, soon, uh, Diane, in, in your country. So it would be fantastic to to continue some of the discussions. Um, but we do see um, uh, uh, that, um, of course, um, uh, this report focuses on uh, multilateral climate funds, and uh, and uh, and these are, are crucial instruments uh, uh, in implementing uh, climate finance. Uh, and also leveraging um, 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 other finance. Um, so, of course, uh, uh, and corruption is an important topic in all areas. And, and Diane, as, as you highlighted, and, and, and given the IPCC has also told us uh, um, that public and private finance flows from fossil fuels, uh, for fossil fuels, are still greater than those climate adaptation mitigation flows. So, of course, it's an important issue uh, in a bigger context. Um, um, still, uh, we do think um, it, uh, uh, and do really appreciate this work um, that you have done on in, uh, uh, focusing on these uh, uh, funds, uh, and and clearly um, um, what you highlight shows that you have made a difference, uh, uh, given that there have been reactions to earlier recommendations, um, and again these funds are crucial. Uh, and some of them are, uh, have been built up uh, recently, and we have to keep uh, building uh, 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 these structures. Uh, and and this is important given given the urgency. Um, uh, so again, uh, we cannot afford, as you say, we cannot afford losing uh, any of uh, uh, um, you know uh, um, of this finance. Um, and uh, and we 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 can say we have really uh, learned a lot also in the past uh, just from getting. Um, um, these kind of reports uh, and for us to pay attention to where we can do better. Um, this is also relevant for bilateral work, but again also for for um, uh, uh, these funds. And um, and uh, we do, um, as has been highlighted, cross, uh, cross learning uh, is important and that's something we also want to take on uh, as a government with different government agencies being involved in different governance structures, including for the funds that you have looked at. So we really uh, hope that this report will spark and invite uh, many practitioners uh, uh, and uh, actors in the field to 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 get together and, and keep uh, talking and keep uh, learning um, uh, in, in addressing this issue and, and really focusing on the importance of, of a, of a well-functioning uh, and sound governance framework, which is something we focus on in terms of the bigger picture also to improve impact and effectiveness uh, and it's good to have uh, uh, your specific uh, view on this on this important issue as well of, of uh, uh, addressing uh, the risk of corruption. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ursula, and thanks for nicely wrapping up the yeah what has been a, an enriching conversation, I believe.